I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. You look at the stuff that's popular on LinkedIn, it's stuff about leadership, how to be happier, how to improve yourself, how to p- improve your chances of a job. I mean, I'm just riffing on this, but you see this as the executive editor of LinkedIn. By the way, I'm here with Daniel Roth, executive editor of LinkedIn. Welcome to the show. How are you, Daniel? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, great. Great to have you on. And uh, uh, we, I said this earlier, but thanks once again for making me a LinkedIn influencer a few months ago. It's oh, been yeah. a, a great pleasure to write for you guys. It's been awesome. It's definitely one of the uh, one of the fastest rises to the top we've ever seen. Oh, good. I didn't um, know that. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got one. So you have one post that's in the top ten right now, right? Yeah, of, of all, all time. time. Of all that time. I know. <laughs> um, so you're up against Richard Branson. You're up against some some pretty big big folks. So it's great. And then your pieces. We know when a gym piece comes in, we're like, all right, we're gonna have a massive traffic day. We know it's gonna be a big day for us. Yeah, you know, it depends. Like sometimes it's it's always interesting to me what gets popular on some platforms and what. Um, is not popular on others. You know, some things I've ha- I've written that are like hugely popular elsewhere will only get like a few thousand views on LinkedIn. Other things get like 1.5 million views. Yep. So that's a huge success, particularly given that we live in a world where people don't really sit around and read that much. So not to criticize anybody, but there's just lots of distractions. There's lots of things to read. There, we know there are a couple things that we can consistently see people are coming to LinkedIn for. Uh, which is anything about technology they care about where the world is going and then management leadership you know how to be how to further your own career um, and how to help other people so like this there's, there's an incredible desire among the users and the readers on LinkedIn to get information that will make them better at what they do or what they want to do and, and I think specifically better at the at the workplace because yep. so many people are unhappy at work so and true. and better at getting a job because there's a lot of people unemployed and and that that 2009 employment situation never really corrected itself. Everybody sort of just got massively demoted in order to get employed again. Yep. So people kind of want to better their lives. Well, it's funny you say that. The that that we, we launched original content on LinkedIn in 2012 with just the influencers. Now anyone can write on LinkedIn. And we have different uh, ways of promoting the influencers versus my members are writing. But when the influencers, when we started the influencer program in 2012, the stories about how to get employed, anything about what to do about how to get a job. Very popular. Starting in March of this year, we saw a massive spike in stories about how to quit. The best yeah. ways to quit, when to quit, how to know when to quit. And I think that what you're talking about. I think that's, that's what I wrote in March. Yeah, exactly. How to quit exactly. your job. Yeah. And or I think the, people are just. To quit your job. And if you look at the data, you can see that there is suddenly the quit rate is picking up. People now feel like there are, I mean, employment is still a horrible problem in the U.S., but there are people who are now employed who did that. You know, took a, a job they didn't like in order to just stay employed, who are now saying, how do I get out of this? How do I get into back into where I want to be? 
And so people are thinking about quitting again. And we watch on the data. The data is showing us that those are the articles about how to quit, how to restart, how to get something new and better. That's those are suddenly doing well. So you get so you have LinkedIn. I view as like a big source of kind of societal data. So now you're getting additional data, which is what are people reading yeah. for self improvement, personal improvement. So that tells you the direction they want to go. You're also getting data, of course, on who's hiring, who's not hiring. You get. I know one company that just started where they analyze. Um, who is changing their resume a lot because these might be people that recruiters can recruit because right. they're about to quit their job. Yeah, there's all these little signals, absolutely. Yeah. I and mean, the only thing I focus on, the thing that I focus mainly on, 99% of my time is just the content, what people are writing, what they're writing about, when they're writing. And I, I still think you can see the same thing. You can start telling when people are writing certain pieces, are they big thought pieces? Are they trying to position themselves for their next job and they want to start defining themselves? Are they... Um, very industry specific, and are they doing it so that they can try to get invited to speak on podcasts and at panels, or are they saying certain things to send signals to their employees or their employer about who they are, how they work? And you can start seeing we're in the early days. We only launched original content for everyone in February, and it's been a slow rollout. Why'd you um, do that, by the way? Why did we do content at all? Well, why did you? You had the influencers, right. which you know. Okay, I want to read Richard Branson's latest thing. I want to read. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk or Michael Azra or heck, I want to. I wanted to be an influencer right in the beginning, but then why did you decide to become a, a huge platform? You know, kind of like a medium. Yeah. So the um, I'll walk you through the, the the process for content on LinkedIn, which I think is is helpful for understanding where why we decided to do it. So we started in 2012. But before I joined LinkedIn, I was the editor of Fortune.com, and before that, I was. A longtime writer at, at Fortune and helped start a magazine called Portfolio at Condé Nast. Always sure, I know Portfolio. Right. That was back in like 2000. You launched in 2007. Exactly. So but we launched in 2006. I loved the magazine, it was by great, the way. Right? Yeah. It was a slick magazine, yeah. Condé Nast, like kind of like the Vanity Fair of finance. Exactly. But it was like right at that peak period where finance fell apart immediately. That's right. And then there's no readers anymore. That's exactly right. But it was a great idea. The year before, it was a great idea, but it was definitely the top. It was probably the last great magazine launch. You, you didn't have like a Rupert Murdoch who he launched, F, you know, uh, Fox Business around the same time, but he's willing to, he was willing to put like $500 million to keep that going yeah. during the rough period. Exactly. Now, so I left there and went to Wired after that, which was great. Also another Condé Nast magazine. But the... In the in the business media space, this was a you know this kind of search for audience has always been an issue. How do we make sure we get the right people reading the right stories? And I joined LinkedIn in 2011, and um, with this idea, of, there was no content on LinkedIn at the time. It was just it was the place you go to connect with other people like you. And and honestly, I didn't use LinkedIn then. I only started using it when you became a content machine. Well, I think it opened up the LinkedIn to people who were not. Passive job candidates or active job candidates or people who just cared about business. Um, and so when we started, we started with LinkedIn Today, which was a uh, which was a way to aggregate content from around the web. So we try to match the the best headline to the right professional at a massive scale. And we did that for exclusively for a little bit over a year. We got a lot of data. We understood what people. We didn't even know what people wanted to read or 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 like or share until we started doing that. From that, we knew that there were certain topics people cared about, ones we just went over, leadership, management, uh, technology, and then some really industry-specific industry ones. You know, if you're in nonprofit, you care a lot about how to use social media better in nonprofit world. If you're in wine and spirits, you care about something. If you're in manufacturing, you care about, you know, lean manufacturing. It's Do really, you match people uh, to articles? Yes. Yeah. So the idea is that we, have, we use algorithms and editors to do that kind of matching. The algorithms can do it at a massive scale. The editors can do it in more of a rifle shot, but, but it's, it, it's always right on. Mm -hmm. And the algorithm is you know hit and miss, but always getting better. <clears throat> and, and the algorithm can do it across 300 million members. So we work, the editors work really closely with the algorithm, the data scientists, data scientists we, with the editors, and we try to get this system in place where we're, we're getting the right headlines to the right people. In 2012, we realized though that this was a, but there was a, a way here to get – once we had this massive audience, we knew people would want to write for it. So we launched the Influencer Program with about 150 people to start. Richard Branson, uh, Barack Obama. This is right at the election. We had Barack Obama and Mitt Romney who were both on there. Um, and Richard Branson hit a million users before yeah. Barack Obama, Mitt Romney, all these guys. Oh, yeah. Well, it turns out he he's like the – 
you know, he, he is, uh, when, when I was at Time Inc., we, you know, everyone knew at Time Magazine that if you put Jesus on the cover, it would be the best-selling cover of the, of the year. And if you were a people, if you put, I don't know, Leonardo DiCaprio on the cover, it would be. Richard Branson is to business what, what Leonardo DiCaprio is to entertainment. He, and he looks a little like Jesus. Like, so, <laughs> you know, you have, yeah, he's got that the long hair, it. the beard. Yeah. But he's, he wrote this one post that was, um, it was like 250 words about happiness. Happiness. You've, God, you've really done your homework. Yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it got, I can't remember what the numbers are now, but it got something like 750 comments. And, and people were, you know, and people aren't talking to Richard. They, they're talking to their own network when they right. do it. And so they're saying, well, here's what I think the secret to happiness is. But that guy can just spark a conversation. It's fascinating. Yeah, I guess because, you know, to some extent you wonder, I mean, his, 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 he made his first million, say, like in 1971. I, I'm making up a year. But with a guy like that, you wonder, is he still in touch with kind of the concerns of the common person? Or, like when he says, here are the six ways to be happy at work, right. is he really talking about the six ways people can be happy at work? Or is he a little out of touch at this point? He is always the great. I think one of the things that he does really well is he talks about things from his own perspective. He never says, here is what you need to do to be happy. He that's, says, here is what I do to be happy. Here's what works for me. That's a that's a very powerful technique. You know, the, the best marketer in the world ever used that exact technique. Uh, and nobody who ever guesses who the best marketer ever, so I'll say it, is, is Buddha. So Buddha basically said to all his followers, don't believe me. This just works for me. You can try it for yourself and see what happens. And of course, Buddhism spread through India like in less than fifty years to you know whatever hundreds of millions of people. So I always think that's like that's the great. best marketing technique. That'd be a great post. If you haven't written that yet, you should you should after, right, after we record that you should write that up. That would do well. Jesus has got some good marketing <laughs> techniques as well. So <laughs> let's, let's start with Buddha. Let's see how it plays. Right, right. Move that's on a to the safer. other major religions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we start. We had the influencer program. We did that. We learned a lot. But we I think even from the beginning. The nice part about the influencer program is we could really control it. And we could see what we never had original content. We had no, you know, I'm taking you behind the scenes, but we had no, we had to build a CMS. We had to build a way for people to write content on LinkedIn. We had to figure out how to populate it. We had to figure out how to make sure that you were notified when someone you were following uh, wrote an article. There were all these pieces that had to be in place. And once we felt comfortable that there was this entire loop, you write a post, you have your followers find it, they choose to follow you, they get notified the next time you write a post. We knew we had a, a real system, and, and from the beginning, we wanted to open this up to everyone. Well, well, but you, but you did it smart, and it, it almost—it's almost the way all of these kind of social networks start up. And let's call this a social network within a social network. Like Facebook started with uh, Harvard, MySpace started with, or or kind of got big with local musicians. So you you, you started this kind of uh, content program. With you know you know with the influencers like a Richard Branson, a Barack Obama, you know other entrepreneurs like like I became familiar with the influencer program when friends like AJ Jacobs or Mike Lazarow were on there. So so it's sort of like you knew you, you and I guess you picked a lot of these guys. You're going to have some content on there that's going to go viral just totally. because these guys are like either celebrities or great writers or somewhere in between. Yep. You know, people that someone like me and many of the listeners will want to hear from, as opposed to just immediately opening up to everyone, and then it's just too much. Absolutely. You can't, you can't have a monopoly if the world is your market. You can have a monopoly if, like, this group of people is your market. Well, we also knew that the – we wanted to set a tone. And the, the, the thinking internally when we did this was if we were launching the world's best business conference – who would you want to put on stage that would attract a crowd? And that not only would attract a crowd, but that crowd would then go into the hallways and discuss it afterwards. And and that's how we formed our list. And we put together this list and said these are the people we'd want to hear from. And the and we wanted to set a tone. And I think the problem is if you just open everyone, you can't you, you can never control tone on a platform. This is a platform. People can write whatever they want. But the influencer set a tone and said, here is what people want to talk about here's the bar that you have to try to achieve to get to the top and we knew that if we open it up to everyone at first the exact you know who would flood it it would be social media marketers people who understood how to do things like this and the whole thing would be tips for how to be better on facebook and how to be better on right. myspace and what businesses should think and and that's because a lot of people want to read that but those guys who are in that industry know how to capitalize on a new platform as soon as it starts 
And that's not the tone we wanted to set. We wanted this to be high level, very much focused on what um, on leadership techniques, but also the idea of these people are, are invited to, you are invited to meetings that other people can't get to. If I work, if I'm a you know, manufacturing, if I work on, a, on, on a, um, I don't know, I'm an insurance adjuster in, in Chicago, I'm not going to be invited to the same meetings you get invited to. And what you hear in those meetings are th- can, can help my career and can help me in whatever I want my next step to be. So we knew we wanted to have that level of insight, to get inside the brains of these people, get them to dump it onto the pages of LinkedIn and make everyone better off. Now, of course, LinkedIn is special. You have hundreds of millions of members, and they're members who are uh, you know, actively seeking something in their lives, some sort of improvement in their lives. So were you like flipping out like, oh, my God, Barack Obama just agreed to do an article on LinkedIn? Oh, yeah. So that must have been a good moment. It was great. You know, the Barack Obama one was actually pretty funny because his team was completely unresponsive at first. And then and Romney's team was too. And then we got a break with Romney. I ta- had a phone call with them. They were like, all right, yeah, we're, we're all in. And so then immediately, five minutes later, called Barack Obama's team. Romney's doing this. Said, oh, yeah, we're in too. So that was great. It's and funny how that technique days. can work. It's like, amazing. Just blatant, yeah. right. like your competitor's doing this. Are you in or are you out? Exactly. And, you know, it's funny that competitive spirit helps drive the entire influencer program, and in general, the member posting one as well, but really the influencers. These are all type A personalities, and they're very much driven by the numbers. And you know, I came from a traditional media background. I was used to working with writers and spending a lot of time worrying about their egos and trying to tell them they've written some beautiful piece and why we should maybe think about cutting it. And you know, it's, and, and the mo- what motivates a professional writer is very different what motivates than what motivates an influencer. If you go to the, the influencer, write something, and I can say to them, it's a terrible piece. It's not going to do well. And, you know, their response is, I don't care. I'm going to put it up anyways. And they put it up, and then they get, you know, 2,000 views, and they're furious. And they call back, and they say, why did that only get 2,000 views? And you say, it's terrible. And then they say, all right, I'm going to do better now. And mm-hmm. then and then they start doing better and better pieces. Or they watch their friends, and they say, well, this guy went to, you know, I was in Harvard Business School with this guy, and, and I was, I'm so much smarter than him. And and he's getting he's doing much better than I do. What how come he's doing it? And they try to reverse engineer it and then it gets competitive. It's great. It's funny because I've seen articles back. reverse engineering LinkedIn yeah. articles. Uh, yeah. So it's great to see. Now now but Richard Branson, there's one where the name I mean Barack Obama too, of course, but like Richard Branson, because he's kind of got this this billionaire to for for the for the common man right. theme going on in his life. Uh, his articles, just the name itself, is going to bring a lot of people. Absolutely, yeah. The people just want to follow. They want to be. They want to be Richard. So, and and you and he's participated. Seems like you did a video with him, right? Like yeah. you did. So so how is that? He's great. He he's actively involved in this. He knows what's. I mean, he cares about LinkedIn. He maintains the the his network on there. He thinks very hard about what his posts are going to be. Every month we do a, a package of content that starts with the influencers and the members join in. Mm-hmm. And he participates in every single one of those. Um, what, why does he do that, you think? I think because he realizes the power. He has more followers on LinkedIn than he does on any other social network. Yeah. These are people who he can see who everyone is. There's no anonymity. He knows exactly who his followers are. If he wants to get into the hotel space, which Virgin does, you know, they can just go back, go through and say, All right, Richard has 500 followers in Phoenix where we're opening a hotel. We'll let them all know. We invite yeah, have them a in. party. You know, yeah, have a party, exactly. So that's interesting, actually. That's an interesting use of LinkedIn. Um, I, I've never thought of it that way. Uh, I guess your can... next book, you look and see. I mean, you talk, you go on book tours, you you know, you can... Let's say let's say you had, like, X number of followers, and you post a status update, and this could be anyone on LinkedIn. What right. percentage... So on Facebook, we know it's like if you have X number of followers, the, the organic reach is something like 2%. Yeah. Um, and that's gone down just because there's so many more people and so on. What, what do you think the organic reach is on LinkedIn? Uh, you know, I've never actually seen the number, but it's going to be very high. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is – for now, this is a the, – the, the people who are posting and posting well can get in front of everyone. Hmm. And you're seeing a lot of members, especially members, realize that. A lot of influencers do it as well. JT O'Donnell is a careers expert, and she is a master of posting these kind of short-form updates, what's going on. T. Boone Pickens – um, has, that guy's a maniac. He's a maniac. He does great status yeah. updates, and people. And he's love like him. what? He's like eighty-one years old. Yeah, exactly. And I've talked to his team. He knows it's another one who is like involved with what's going on here. Um, writes great posts. Just had a great one about why hiring the best team 
doesn't actually the best people doesn't actually make for the best team. And that's like real world anecdotes about people he's hired and why they've worked out, even though they might not be the best in what they do. Um, and so, you know, they, they, you can still get in front of everyone and they're very smart. You're seeing individuals who are, who are realizing this, who are writing great posts to talk to their what's uh, what's interesting to watch is when they're talking to their companies, because everyone, you know, if, if you're a CEO, there's a good chance that 90 percent of your employees are going to be on LinkedIn. And if they are, if they are connected to you, um, the, every one of your updates they're going to see. So you can have this kind of soft influence on your company by writing mm. posts or doing status updates on LinkedIn. Every, all of your employees see it. It's a way to gently guide them without sending that all internal email saying, like, here are my thoughts on, you know, the Snapchat, uh, what Snapchat is going, or, or here yeah, are my thoughts. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and, and some people are doing that. And then there are other people. There was, one, there was a post a few months ago by a guy who was a butler. And this is to be clear. These are not influencers. No, no, these are just, now it's just, just general members. That's right. Yeah. And there was a guy who was a, a butler talking about modern butlerhood, why everyone who's, he was getting angry that everyone thinks it's like Downton Abbey, but it's nothing like that, and here's what it's really like. And that's what I find t rewarding about the non-influence, the, the push away from influencers. You know, we have our influencers, but now when you open up to everyone, the serendipity starts happening, and you start getting these amazing posts from people who you never, I would never would have gone and said, let's, let's figure out what butlers have to say. That would never have in a million, you know, story ideas that never would have come to me. Nor would you have read that if he had a, his own personal right. site about butlering. Exactly. You never would have like, never even if it had gone it. viral, like, and you saw it on Buzzfeed, you never would have like clicked on nope. it. But on LinkedIn, there's some, it's a trusted site. Yes. So this is, I, I constantly tell people actually, don't necessarily blog on your own website. Like, Go on a trusted site and because that's where you'll be trusted right. as opposed to like, you know, your own name dot com or whatever. Yep. Uh, it takes years to it takes years of being on trusted sites to have your own name dot com. Everyone starts off with your own name dot com, which is like the wrong direction. That's right. You know, there's a study. Um, if you sell something on your own site versus selling it on Amazon, there's like a 70 percent more conversion rate on ads and stuff if you sell it on Amazon, just because Amazon is a trusted site. Yeah, absolutely. It rubs off on you. There's no question you get a benefit. You get that kind of um, that uh, that kind of lift that comes from being on a place where people are. They know what it's about. And I think on LinkedIn, and we have studies that show this, that people trust LinkedIn because of the lack of anonymity. They also trust it because you only do one thing on LinkedIn. No one's posting cat pictures or pictures right. of, you know, talking about what they did over the weekend. It's like, this is business. It's professional. That's it. What what how did how did LinkedIn over the years keep it that way? Like uh, potentially, I could post about cats, absolutely, uh, just like I do on. I mean, I don't on Facebook, but if I did on Facebook, I could do it on LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, what what stopped people? Was it the community, like peer pressure almost? Well, the that I mean, number one, we've only had content. We've only members have really only been able to post rich media and um, and long form post. For, I don't know a year now I mean it's, it hasn't been very long we're in the early days but what's interesting is the influencer program did help set a bar and the commenters are really um, they will jump in if they feel like something is not yeah what's LinkedIn this doing on LinkedIn yeah well I don't why, why is this here I never expect that it's and it's wild to watch because you're like you've only this is new what do you you you've already set expectations it's great to see but they don't like hearing about politics they don't like hearing about personal and so they really want to hear they, – they are here for a, sp a specific purpose, and they will let the original poster know when something is not what they expect to see. Uh, of course, the best uh, volume posts are the ones where there's controversy because then you have comments arguing with each other, and they're going back to check to see, oh, did anyone respond to my comments or whatever. Right. Like my article that was uh, 10 Reasons to Quit Your Job This Year – Half the people liked it and half the people hated it, but they all visited the article right. and they all argued with with everybody, you know, forever on it. Yep. So, so so sometimes the most controversial will get the most views. I've noticed that over time. It's I think that is true in general. It doesn't ha it doesn't it's not usually true on LinkedIn. We ha there are times where I've, there have been posts that I've thought oh, this one's going to be a blockbuster because it's going to do exact have that exact dynamic, and people just don't bite. They don't they don't fall for, they don't take the bait. Yeah. And um. They, it, it's a really, it's an aspirational crowd. These are people who are on, on. They come to LinkedIn be, for a purpose, and so there have been posts that I that I thought were really funny and that were really sarcastic and that have done terribly. And the commenters, 
have weighed in and said, you know, why are you don't give this guy? There was one about some guy had, had left. He was the CEO. It was it was about the CEO of um, the former CEO of Groupon, and he left and recorded a um, a CD all about with songs about business. And we had one of the influencers did a review of it. It was pretty scathing. It was hilarious, and the commenters gave him a hard time. They were like, "This guy Andrew is really trying to rebuild himself. He's on. He's doing a second act. Who are you to say he's not? You know that he's no good." That's great, actually. I'm really fascinating. I'm proud of LinkedIn for that. For, it, for it the LinkedIn was, community. It was a real eye opener, and I was like, "Oh, this is this is what works. People want to they want to support other people. They want to make people better. They want to be better, and they don't want to have the same kind of cynicism that." Um, that really worked well everywhere else I've worked is not necessarily the formula for success here. Well, well, it's interesting because what what makes LinkedIn and Facebook similar and different from any other social network out there, every other social network that's ever existed, is that you guys have embraced identity. Like people are not anonymous, and in Facebook, it's more about connecting with family, friends, and potential dates. And LinkedIn, it's been about connecting with people who can help you get a job yep. or or network with. What's to stop LinkedIn, and maybe it hasn't stopped with LinkedIn, but like, well, I would use LinkedIn as like a dating service if I was a single guy. I'm a married guy, but LinkedIn certainly seems possible to connect with people that way. Do you see that happening? I don't. See, this comes up a lot, surprisingly mm-hmm. often. In uh, the office? Like, like, no, no, talk no, in the office. It? No, it's <laughs> like you talk to, you go, the people are uh, running to, I was talking to a friend who was recently divorced who was like, oh, yeah, I love LinkedIn for, you know, vetting my dates before I go on them. And, and in LinkedIn, too, you can see who looked at your right. you pay. You can see who looked at your page. You can't do that on Facebook. So, of course, you can see all the women who looked yeah. at your page. And, uh... <laughs> but it's not. I mean, when we think about this company is incredibly well run. And the focus on um, thinking about what it is that that, that, the co- that, that as a company we're going to go after. What are the markets that we are chasing? What are the op- big opportunities out there? There's this whole idea of the economic graph. And the, our CEO, Jeff Weiner talks about connecting every opportunity in the world with every professional and what happens when you can learn exactly what skills you need and get those skills and find the job in in you know in a remote part of India that you might need or someone's in the remote India and, and needs to move to Chicago because they have the right skills for this particular position how do we achieve this world where everything is net where every economic opportunity is networked together and make LinkedIn a huge component in in in, in enabling that if not the single component and so he sets this a massively high goal for us, and everything's mapped against it. So when you think about the dating site, the dating site's not something that is, it's like, there comes up, we're like, oh, we have the data, we could actually pull this off. But there's no one internally who's serious about actually chasing it because it doesn't map against the overall larger goal. Well, well, and I like how you put it economic opportun- as quote-unquote economic opportunity versus job. Because it could be the case that the nature of what a job is changes. Absolutely. And also it could be the nature of what you say it's an aspirational audience. It could be the nature of what they want changes. So they might want to be solopreneurs or lifestyle entrepreneurs or work for nonprofits or whatever as opposed to a traditional job. Like that focus might change over time. And being able to find economic opportunities as opposed to a job. I think initially LinkedIn was about finding a job. Yeah. And now I, I think it is leaning... It, not that that's gone, but people are now expanding the definition to economic opportunity. So, what are what are some success stories that you've seen uh, in terms of, in, in, whether this is in the data or anecdotally? Like, have people found their life's goals, you know, through LinkedIn? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, does I, it work? I, it does work. I mean, it's work. This is this is still again, this is where the economy's headed. This idea of you don't ha- you might have a job for a few years, but the idea of next acts and Reed Hoffman, the founder, just wrote a book recently about this um, uh, called The Alliance. And the idea is that you don't hire people for life anymore. And everyone we've known that for a long time, but it's getting to the point where the employers and the employees are being honest with each other, saying, I'm here to get some skills out of you or I'm here to create a career or, or this is a, a something I'm doing for three years to learn something and then we'll reevaluate. And you can see the economy moving into this area where whether we like it or not people are going to be changing a lot they're going to be solo what you call it solo entrepreneurs solopreneur. solopreneurs um and and you're forced to even if you're not going to become one you should always have in the back of your head the idea that i might be forced to be one at some point and so the we've seen certain people on linkedin and again i'm coming to this from the content side but um there was a guy who wrote a, a post recently about when he was broke 
and he went to an Aldi, uh, which is like a you know a fast uh, a uh, like a Seven Eleven type place, and this kind of recognition that he had no money, he had to figure out what to do with himself, and this he had this whole kind of eye opening experience that led to him getting a number of jobs and not being happy. It was a great piece, and at the end he says, you know, follow my newsletter. And he has this little, and he gets this newsletter, and he b- builds that up, and he writes a book, and that book helps fund him, and he does speaking tours, and you know, he's got this whole side gig going where he's making all this money on the side doing other things, where he's being a consultant and he's writing books, and and I just think this is obviously the incredibly earliest, you know, t- beginning stages of this process, but if you're in manufacturing and you're writing about you know, what you're, the changes that are coming to logistics and, you know, making this up or robotics and, and you're doing these posts, you're all, you're building your own identity so that when I need to hire a, a, when I damn Roth need to hire a manufacturing expert, I'm going to read this post and say, this guy knows what he's talking about. And I've now, that economic opportunity has now happened. I hire him because he's proven himself through his writing and we learned about each other through LinkedIn. And then we do, we actually exchange real world dollars because of that. You know, that's that's how the economic graph starts starts yeah. uh, coming into real into reality. I mean, do you have any data right now over the years how many jobs LinkedIn has resulted in? I'm sure we do. I think we do. I don't know, but I don't actually have that sitting here right now. I can get back to you with that. That would be that would be an up. interesting yeah. statistic, just because that was again the initial goal, right. say, was to hook up, uh, you know, em- potential employees with recruiters or HR personnel or whatever. Yep. Um, but like you said, now I think there's now LinkedIn as kind of this ecosystem has created a lot more opportunities. So here's a guy who, you know, so writing is always important, like the ability to whether express yourself at 140 characters or a Facebook status or now a LinkedIn post, being good at that will create opportunities for you. Absolutely. And I think you saw you see that with the Butler example and with yeah. the example you just said, you know, these people create a brand. Yep. Absolutely. We said there was a lawyer recently in Chicago who did a post and and was then invited. But Lexis Nexus reached out to her and said, "Can you write this for our blog?" You know, we saw this thing; it was great. We want to run it here, and you just start getting these. You have ways to reach. This is a a lawyer who would not have. This post was about a very arcane part of of law. It was not saying that would have been, maybe not have been found elsewhere. But he reaches people through LinkedIn. The because we can apply our network effect to your great thinking it can spread be in a way that it couldn't sp- it couldn't have spread before sure if if i were a lawyer i would every day take a question that i was asked over the past week by one of my clients and write the whole answer for free and put it on linkedin Genius. absolutely as much free content as you give out and this is just sort of general advice the more clients you will get yeah and lo- every lawyer should be doing that yep. but there are don't lawyers are afraid to like share because they think people are going to steal yeah but, uh, you know, that's changing, too. Absolutely. You know, my wife is a, is a school consultant in Brooklyn, and she recently started a blog that was just interviews school leaders. She puts it up on her site. She puts it up on LinkedIn, of course. And the amount of viewers she's getting to these are well beyond what she could have gotten if she'd given a speech at some local community center about how to think through, you know, public school choices. Do, do and, her LinkedIn posts beat her blog posts in traffic? Oh, by a massive numbers just like a lawyer if he was on linkedin they're gonna beat the if on a i never read a blog on a lawyer on a right. law firm site but i'm gonna read a linkedin post yes right and what's nice about it is that it's tied to it's tied to your identity and i think this is something that people struggle with especially lawyers accountants is that if you write a post in third person and if you write this kind of denuded uh post that doesn't have any personality in it it's not going to do well people right. are they want to learn from you they don't want to learn from your company or your LLC. They want to hear what you have to say as an expert, and they want to hear your voice. And, and that takes some getting used to. You're used to it. You write in first person without a problem. You reveal, you open your kimono. You reveal everything about yourself. Yeah. And almost in ways that, you know, I want to close one eye sometimes when reading some of your posts because it's so, they're so raw and honest. I've, I've lost all my friends and family <laughs> since since I started writing, but fortunately but, I have new friends and family. <laughs> that's you so. get new ones. <laughs> but that, it, it honestly is, is one of the biggest pieces of advice that I give new writers to who are writing on LinkedIn and other places coming from the business world is you have to be willing to talk about yourself. You have to be willing to admit mistakes. People love hearing mistakes and how you came, o- how you overcame them. And they want to hear who you are. They want to understand you. And the more it sounds like it's written by a committee, the less they'll read it. That's totally true. And n- nobody wants to read from a pedestal either. So yes. like meaning if, if you're standing on your pedestal saying, here's the 10 ways to be, uh, I don't know the greatest CEO in the world. No one's going to want to read that either, particularly because no. a lot most people who write those have never been CEOs of anything. So, right. 
but people now are starting to get that. I think I think writers are starting to get that. Like writing in general is improving. I hope. It's crazy that we're still talking about writing, isn't it? This was by this point it was supposed to be done. All video you <laughs> done. It was no yeah. written word was gone, but there's still the uh, the the ease of people, you know, flipping through your phone of quickly gaining some information and then of moving on to something else. Real you can realize so quickly whether it's worth your time or not. And with yeah. and video, it still takes a while to get there. Um, you know, podcasts are a lean back experience, but but writing, you can. It's a, it, the written word is still the fastest way to quickly get some information or realize whether something is is worth your time. Sure. Like other than my own podcast, I don't really listen to podcasts. Like really? you know, because I'm not really a good listener of like I, I wasn't a good student, um, but I love reading. So uh, good writing to me is is art. Yeah. So. Whether it's about uh, fiction or whether it's a post on LinkedIn, like you can tell the art from the non-art, right. and that's really important. Like it's a skill that needs to be developed because, in a weird way, there's more text than ever now. Yeah, I mean, even books, a million books or so were published last year, uh, just last year, from 1880 to 1980, a million books were published. So last year was just as many books as published an entire century before the word processor started. It's so, amazing. Yeah. So people are still writing books. I don't know if they're still reading them, but I, I think more books than ever are being bought. That's incredible. You know, thanks yeah. to Amazon. Absolutely. I was just on the way out here. I was just up, adding some more to the Kindle. It's, you know, it's I'm going through way more than I used to. And podcasts, I listen to while I'm commuting or doing the dishes. That's like my, yeah. my podcast time. Yeah, like I listen to co co uh, comedy podcasts sometimes, and uh, you know, while I'm, I don't know, I don't even know because I don't commute that much, but. Uh, uh, you know, what about having, what about opening up LinkedIn to something like a podcast network or, you know, competing with iTunes on the podcast level? Because there's no reason for Apple to dominate podcasts and right. there's 20,000 podcasts and 6 billion downloads a year. It's, it's another source of content. Yeah. I mean, right now we are looking at what the data tells us about what people want. So you can see when people link to podcasts, you can see when people link to videos, when they embed a video in their post and the data will help tell us where what the next steps are I, I don't think podcasts right now are a massive opportunity in just going back to the idea of figuring out where you want to spend your your capital and your time and engineering resources and and the you know the the opportunity for podcasts might not be as large as some other ones yeah so 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 what are the next steps on the kind of content platform I think we want to make sure that we are getting better about um, we're always thinking about relevance. How do we get the right stories of the right people? That's a huge um, component of, of of getting this right, and and of making sure that that this is something that you always come back to. If you if you feel like you've gotten twenty, LinkedIn has given you twenty headlines, and you want to read nineteen of those, that's amazing. If you want to read ten of them, that's still still great. No, usually on the list of. You know, LinkedIn, sometimes I'm not totally used to the interface, maybe because I started using it the most when I started writing for it. Yep. Um, so sometimes, depending on what device I'm using, I'm getting a different interface. But usually I see a list of articles somewhere, and they usually are articles I'm interested in. Right. Like, I click two or three times every time I go there. Well, it so, should be getting. I mean, that's there, there is a lot of brain power being put behind that right now. And then the other one is, you know, the look and feel of this. We want to make sure it's always getting better, that the writing – that the reading experience is better, that the writing experience gets better, um, that everything works beautifully and seamlessly over mobile, that it's easy to share, that updates are easier. You know, what We want this to be the single place that you go. You know, my, my goal is that within a year, you never go show up at a, uh, you, know, you don't start your day without checking LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. That the articles you need are on LinkedIn, whether that's on mobile or on desktop or showing up to you an email, however it shows, or WeChat, whatever you're using. And then within 18 months, you don't show up at a meeting without checking LinkedIn because the information you need for that meeting is going to be is going to be there. So, so let, let me let me throw some ideas at you and see uh, if this is on your radar at all. What about like a or maybe it's already been created and shelved for some reason. What about like a LinkedIn Answers kind of competing with a Quora or a Yahoo Answers? Because it seems like with LinkedIn Answers, it could be very specific, like. What's it like to interview at Google? And yeah. then everybody who's linked, to, you know, interviewed at Google and your network will, or other networks will start answering. Yep, love it. We used to actually have that product at one point. I, I seem to remember there yeah, was we, something. Yeah, we had something like that, and it went away before, right when I joined. Right when I, I joined, so I'm not sure exactly what the uh, 
what 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 happened there, but I think it's something that comes up a lot. I think it could be incredibly useful. So, because Quora like seems it. to always increase in traffic. Are I, you a Quora user? Yeah, I'm a yeah. I'm a Quora user, and I I notice that. So Quora also has a publishing platform, so you can publish a blog direct, or you can answer questions, and the answers that I the questions that I answer always gets more views than if I take the exact same content and make it a blog post. Huh. So there, and I and I created a finance site once, stockpicker.com. Once I, there, I remember the day specifically. It was April first, two thousand eight. I started a Q and A version, like a like stock picker answers, and it was my traffic went up fifty percent that day. So and stayed that way. Wow. Like it moved up. So uh, answers are compelling. Like people like to ask and like to answer and comment and so on. Love it. All right, what else you got? Um, I had some more. But uh, I was thinking of the podcast thing just because that, that seems to be a good distribution right. platform. Answers for... podcast. I'm going to have a whole list of, of – you're going to see all these roll out on LinkedIn. We're just going to call it you know, yeah. the, gym, the, the gym ideas. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing I was wondering is, you know, combining meetups. Now, you have groups on LinkedIn, right. but you don't quite – like other people have made businesses out of forming meetups and webinars around LinkedIn groups and people and interests and so on. But you guys haven't gotten into that space as much. Yeah, I think a lot of our thinking around that is how can we enable other people to do it well? And are there APIs that we can offer them? Or are there ways that we can make sure that if you're going to do a meetup that the and that, that is around a LinkedIn group, you have the resources you need to get there? I'm not sure that we've – that I'm not sure how many people have used them or, or exactly how they work. But I know this is a it, – it, it is a – it's a, a constant thought is – we know we realize that this has a real world component to it. Yeah, because like, uh, so I had uh, Lewis Howes on the podcast at one point, and I, I don't know if you know who he is, but he's um, he's created a seven figure a year business for himself, organizing LinkedIn webinars and meetups, uh, and then teaching others how to do it. So he's he's a really good guy. I could always introduce you if Absolutely. you want. Absolutely. Wow. Um, another another interesting business is something like um, uh, I don't know if you've seen Clarity FM. So. Uh, Experts say what they're an expert in. So let's say I'm an expert on SEO, as you know, search engine optimization, and another person needs some SEO for their website. Uh, I can call the SEO expert through Cl- Clarity.fm and pay per minute. He lists his price per minute, and I could pay him. So LinkedIn right now is you could almost think the original purpose, which is hooking up uh, uh, potential employees to HR personnel. That's almost become an old-fashioned purpose, and you even said that it used that in your language by calling it an economic opportunity rather than a job. But what about really creating the economics on LinkedIn? So, uh, so let's say, you know, I'm on the board of a public company. Someone wants to talk to a guy who's been on the board of a public company. I say my right on my LinkedIn profile. If you want to talk to me, it's a thousand bucks an hour, and people call up, and you work out the economics, and and then and. and the payment happens, and it's a trusted site. So that's a, a, a money maker. Yeah. And everybody trusts LinkedIn. Is these are the valid resumes, and you can, and there's also comments and endorsements. So everything's taken care of to exactly set this up, except for the payment system. And it's super interesting. It is. These are the kind of decisions like this are certainly happening at a pay grade above mine. And um, you know, this is I I I know that these kind of questions. Th- there are so many opportunities. That LinkedIn could go after, and and the idea of staying focused and of figuring out what are the biggest, how do we put the right you know resources behind where we think the biggest bets are, um, is something that consumes a lot of senior management time, and um, so I, I just don't know where these fall in, in terms of priorities. You know, and another one is you have you have SlideShare, which is really powerful. Like a yeah. lot of authors use SlideShare now to market their books, but what about something even more um, general? Uh, like a Scribd where any documents uh, can be posted up. Well, you can do that on SlideShare. SlideShare has a, a, a template for – SlideShare reads the um, – anything that you're uploading to SlideShare, SlideShare will, will, will understand what it is that you're putting up there, and it will reformat based on the original documents. So infographics, for instance, look amazing on SlideShare. Um, books do really well on SlideShare. Books Some people boot, yeah. I've been amazing for me. Like, so my, my first SlideShare presentation got like 350,000 views. I'm sure it was a, a – I try to rank my marketing for my books. I think it was the fourth most successful thing I was doing, which is good because I tried like 50 different things. That's great. Well, I know that the um, – and we can encourage all authors to make sure they're using 
I encourage everyone to use SlideShare, but it definitely works for authors. You know, the other thing that works for authors that we saw was um, I was talking to Adam Braun recently. The guy, you know, Pencils, Pencils of Promise. Promise. Yeah, he's exactly. been on my podcast. Oh, great. He's a great guy. Yeah. And he said that the biggest single driver of of, uh, of sales for his book was LinkedIn. Really? It was an influencer post. A guy named Alex uh, Banyan, who's a, a VC, had written an, a, a post saying he's a young v- – he, I think he was the youngest big VC ever. And he wrote this post saying here are the 20 books that if you're under 25 you should read. And one of them was Pencils of Promise. And huge spike in sales that day on Amazon and, and Adam. So it was interesting because you could see where, you know, on Amazon where it says these are the other books that people bought. It was Alex's whole list. So mm-hmm. people were just going through going, yes, 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 yes. So that works. And then SlideShare is a proven um, uh, converter also. Yeah, SlideShare is great. I mean, I would definitely – I don't even know if people fully understand the connection between LinkedIn and SlideShare. Like I would definitely try to figure out yeah. how to get more – content on there or even influencer content in SlideShare. You know what we have now that's, that I've been really excited about is we we're working with uh, Shark Tank. And Shark Tank oh. has been posting videos uh, from what they call Shark Tank Week, which is their, uh, the week before the series starts, and it's, it's highlights from the previous years. And we've been putting up um, clips of just people pitching the sharks. Those video because videos live on SlideShare also. So those videos are on SlideShare. And then the different sharks and people who have been on the show are writing about the clips, and so they write on LinkedIn. They embed the SlideShare video in their posts, and they're, it's doing phenomenally well. Ah, that's and great. so Shark Tank is really figuring out how to how to make the most of it. Yeah, no, I've had um, at least uh, two Shark Tank uh, guys on the podcast. One hasn't nope. been released yet, um, but I had Mark Cuban on the podcast. Great. So, and I'm interviewing uh, Ke- Kevin Harrington in a few weeks. All right. So that, that's a good source of... Uh, business material because it's like you know between shark tank and the profit which is cnbc's yep. almost version of it um it's, it's like an mba rather than rather than getting the mba and it is it turns out to be a, a a complete fit with linkedin you know we talked earlier about the idea of people getting upset when they see something that feels on linkedin on linkedin the shark tank stuff they love there yeah. is a a sense that this is someone's this is not my quote someone said this in a comment said this is the American Idol for our crowd. Right. I that's love funny. that. It's like, yeah, that's awesome. That's exactly right. How's um how's the search engine on LinkedIn? So, like, let's say I'm looking for uh, Shark Tank. Uh, will I be able to easily yes. find all the articles that mention Shark Tank? Easily. Um, y- yes is the answer. You can find it all. You go. There's a search bar at the top. On if you're doing it on desktop, search bar at the top. You click on it, and the left rail it says posts. Click on the posts, you see them all there. A lot of people are using hashtags. So if you search for hashtag Shark Tank Week, for instance, uh, I checked, I don't know, on Friday, there were probably 40 posts using that uh, hashtag. Ah, okay. And then that's one But were people searching that hashtag? And are people, some people are searching the hashtag. So we've got to say, again, we're in the early days of this, but you can right. start seeing where things are going based on that. Because you can see the, the search engine is very powerful because, like, YouTube, for instance, by itself is like the third largest search engine in the world. So Things like that have have power to drive, uh, you know, multiple use. Hundred percent agree with you. Absolutely. So, so, so Dan, what what would you like to see happen next on LinkedIn? It's kind of a final question. What what would you like? Where where is this going? What's the next step? Um, I think there are. Well, let me throw this back at, at you and your listeners, if that's all right. Because sure. what I but because the way that we get to the next step is through everyone actually doing this, and and I think that if we can get more people. If we can get everyone thinking about writing and sharing their content, on LinkedIn is a way to build their own professional identities, is a way to say, here's who I am, here's what I believe in, here's where the where I think the professional world is going. Then you start getting some really cool um, communities being formed. People start learning from each other. The content starts getting better and better, which is good for everyone, not just LinkedIn. Um, and I think that we are in such uh, we are in such an early phase of this happening where people feel comfortable and you feel super comfortable. It's not this is part of your nature. But for a lot of people, they still have this problem where they say, I don't know what to write about. I don't know who cares what I think about. And that just isn't true. If Number one, there's no cost to doing it anymore. Just do it. Put it right. out there. See what happens. I think that people are afraid the cost is their boss will see. But what I would recommend, tell a personal story that you feel is slightly dangerous. Don't don't go. You don't have to say, okay, uh, here, this was. I was in jail and this and that. Do something that was slightly. Do, write something that's slightly dangerous that you're slightly afraid 
to publish. Yes. Uh, and just try that first and see how it feels. You can take it down a day later if, you, right. if you're too uncomfortable. But challenge yourself to be dangerous. The other thing I would challenge everybody to do is on LinkedIn right now, it's very easy to put your resume. Try an article where it's not writing. It's just a simple list. Here's 100 things about myself that are not going to be in the resume. Because then that's something, I, and if I'm an employer, I could say, okay, well, here's the resume. They know how to do it. But now I want to see, oh, this person likes Star Wars and likes these websites and has this, you know, likes this, these foods and whatever. So yeah, absolutely. all these things that I would have to normally piece together through Facebook and Twitter and whatever. Now I could just see it side by side with the resume. Yep. I, I Someone wrote to me and said that that became that list of 100 items that this person wrote was more valuable than the resume for employers. That's wild. So I challenge people to use the LinkedIn platform for, for that. Yeah, that's great. Well, Daniel, uh, thanks a lot for coming on for the show. Me. It's It's been really great. And then you guys are doing amazing things at LinkedIn. And like I said, I wasn't a believer in LinkedIn, let's call it, four years ago, but now I am. It's, been, right. a, it's been a big part of my life. Excellent. Love hearing that. Well, thanks again for having me. Yeah, thanks, Dan. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.